down at the bar, friends, grab a drink. We have Dr. Jaron Sullivan on deck. We're going to talk everything knee pain. Let's go. I'm excited to be able to say that this is another We Back episode. We back. We back. Jaron, we back. couldn't be much more excited to have you back on than I am tonight, my man. Thank you so much for coming back on. Welcome to the bar. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be back again. I really enjoyed our conversation before, and uh, it's nice to talk about knees. Man, I can't wait. Loved the last time. The feedback was incredible. I had an absolute blast. But I made sure tonight at least a stair-step better drink choice. I had to pull rank a little bit, and there was no way I was lemon dropping again. So I got a little bit of an upgrade. But what are you drinking tonight? <laughs> so I've got this stuff all good drinks are made of. But very basic. Just out of the clinic and uh, got a, got some water here. <laughs> nice, man. I like it. I like it. So tonight, I'm actually going mint julep. So we may not nice. get to see the derby right now. That may not be a thing. But, uh, you know, some may argue that Secretariat's best athlete of all time. I don't know. I read a good article about it. <laughs> thought, you know what? Let's tap into that tonight. Let's go. Let's do this thing. So, yeah, mint julep. Got the cup and everything. Big props to my wife on pulling this out. <laughs> Fantastic. Cheers. Thanks, man. Well, we always do a cheers to charity. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the charity that you are so kind to be able to give to tonight. Yeah. So, um, uh, basically, uh, the, my, uh, concept on, or, or the reason I chose this charity was a little bit out of, uh, um, some personal experiences that I've had. Um, and, I had a, uh, I started out, uh, three years ago taking care of the minor league soccer team at that point, Nashville soccer club with one of my partners, Kevin Dabrowski and, um, Kevin, really amazing guy, uh, had a fantastic experience getting to know him, working with him. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of funny. We started out, it was a little rough around the edges, um, in terms of trying to, you know, balance, uh, taking care of these athletes and, who, what roles each person plays. And the longer we worked together, the closer we became friends. And um, about, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, a year into it, he developed lung cancer. And about six months after that, he died, which was horrible. Um, in the process of him going through that, uh, I was put in contact. Oh, now I'm forgetting the name of this. Uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> why did I forget the name of the organization? Uh, help, caring bridge? Is it? Help, uh, caring bridge. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the caring, I, I got put in contact with the caring bridge, what their bridge website through his family. And, and it was a fantastic way to follow along with their journey and to experience some of the hard things that they were going through an open platform to discuss, you know, successes, uh, uh, as he went through that. Um, and, and this was the second time that I'd had the experience, uh, interacting with caring bridge. Um, so in uh, going through everything right now with uh, uh, COVID and some of the challenges it brings up to families' lives, it made it made me think about Kevin and and my interactions with him, and then taking care of athletes. And it, I wanted to give back to that organization. So I think it's a great organization. It's a way for families to stay in touch when they go through hard things, and it it addresses the side of you know losing someone we love. Um, that's the human side, the interaction, the uh, uh, not just, you know, the, the medical care, but also the, um, uh, the connection. So I think it's a Absolutely. great, a really great program. I think so too. I had a uh, very close family experience with caring bridge as well. Uh, second cousin, just very, very traumatic story, but the same concept that was able to bring together and do an amazing thing for them by being able to pull together funds to be able to go to a big Disney trip uh, before her passing. So I, I, th those types of uh, programs are so incredible. And I really appreciate you bringing some light to that tonight. The one thing that we want to be able to announce tonight, then next week we'll have a little bit more details on it. But for anybody who gives to any of the charities, and this isn't about the monetary value that was supplied to it, but any amount that you give, we are going to offer a shot glass 
of two docs that you can pick up at Active Spine and Joint Center. All you have to do is show a receipt of any amount that you have donated to any of the um, charities brought up on the show, and we can hook you up with a, a limited edition two docs shot glass. That's coming your way. Um, Jaren, we have had the uh, fortune to be able to collaborate on several knee cases here recently, and I thought, what better topic to be able to shine some light on from the expertise side, from the surgical side and the rehabilitation side on such a complex topic. And I think that there's so much that we could go here. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight and I can't wait to deep dive knee with you tonight. So cheers, brother. Let's do this thing. Cheers. That sounds great. Man, real briefly, if you could just take a few seconds and for those that aren't as familiar with the knee itself or the idea of uh, the cartilage between the knee, I want to bring up a picture, an anatomical picture of the knee real briefly. And I would love for you to just take us through maybe a few sentences about how we should be thinking about the knee or how maybe orthopedically that, that we think about the knee. Fantastic. So, you know, one of the things that I think we overlook is that the knee in terms of how it, its motion uh, function or how it functions is the most complex joint in the body. Um, it, it pivots, it rotates. It goes front to back, side to side, and uh, it requires a lot of neuromuscular control in order to get the knee to function right. Um, as far as the, uh, and, and that's the dynamic side, the muscles and the ligaments. On the flip side, you've also uh, got the bone structure that allows for normal motion. And then you've got cartilage, which is the cushion that's going to cover each side of the joint. And then you've got some accessory types of cartilage, such as the meniscus, they give you uh, um, uh, other functions in the knee, like they lubricate, they give you some cushioning, kind of like a shoe. Um, so, you know, when you look at the big picture of the knee, you've got the cartilage, you've got the bone, you've got the ligaments, and then you've got the muscles controlling it. Yeah, that's great. What I want to start off with is something that we see and hear all the time, is that someone will get referred into the clinic. And a lot of times when we see them at our office, it could be for an ankle problem, it could be a low back or a shoulder, and, but we still do a very thorough full body evaluation because we, we see that so, it's your movement vitals. We, your movement system is so important. We wanna tackle all of it. We wanna see what is your state of the union on how your body's actually doing. And all the time, knee will get brought into it and they will, have someone has told them in the past that, oh, my knee is bone on bone. And then it's almost like there's this radio silence. So I really want to go through because not only are you a really great orthopedic surgeon, but you've had great experience with other great surgeons, great mentors. I want to talk about this from basically every angle. If I'm an individual and I've heard, oh, my knees are bone on bone. And now that may not be what the provider had told them. That may have been their take home from the conversation. But when they have that as their take home, we see that that frequently institutes a huge barrier into their logic or their mindset around their knee. And so could you start us off a little bit, maybe just explaining when someone says, my knee is bone on bone, what does that actually mean? Okay, so a lot of times, as a, from a surgical perspective, we decide that someone could be a candidate for a knee replacement if they have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, meaning the cartilage is totally wore out. So you've, you know, in between the joint, you've got the two cartilage uh, caps, and when those are completely gone on X-rays, you can see the bone is touching the bone, meaning there's no space between the two bones in the joint. And that doesn't mean that you need a knee replacement. It just means that you would be a candidate. It also, in general, represents like severe end stage uh, degenerative changes in the knee, uh, arthritic changes in the knee, where the knee is completely wore out. It's kind of like, you know, wearing the bottom off of your shoe. You're walking barefoot on the ground because you have no cushion. So I think that's the big picture of what bone on bone, you know, uh, means when when people are trying to convey that. Yeah. And when you actually get in there and say it is a case where you're going to do a, a total knee replacement and you go in there and you look at the knee itself on those cases of imaging, when you get to look at that surface and actually see that versus the x-ray, 
Are there times where there's still cartilage in certain places? It's just more patchy or is it literally almost every time completely gone? They have no cartilage at all. I'd say 95% of the time it's patchy. So you, you, you still have a lot of healthy cartilage in the joint. You might just have one area that's particularly worn down. And, um, so it's, it's, uh, the only time you ever see like global cartilage loss are going to be like horrible inflammatory arthropathies, um, which usually are, don't happen now because we have really good medications to control those types of our, uh, arthritis. And then the other type is if they have a missed infection, like they had a really bad mm-hmm. infection and it can take out all the cartilage. Um, but, but that's also pretty rare because the infections aren't missed, uh, like that. So most of the time you just get patchy spots where they, they lose their, uh, cartilage. And, you know, even, even in the office, a lot of times, like if you just do a standing AP X-ray, um, it might look totally normal, but if you do a flex knee film, you'll see that, you know, there is more advanced wear. Um, and then a, a lot of times that word bone on bone, uh, it gets thrown around, but not accurately. You know, I, I see that I saw somebody in clinic today, actually, that, um, you know, it, it came in saying, Hey, I have bone on bone arthritis and we did the x-rays and they actually don't, they have, you know, a, a reasonable joint space and someone that I think would be a great candidate for, you know, um, rehabbing the knee and getting things back, you know, and back in shape and feeling better without having to do anything too aggressive. So in a case like that, because this is leading right into the same conversation we have to have all the time, what's that experience like for you? So that individual that came in, they said, Hey, my knee's bone on bone. You reached, took the x-ray. So you, you had him standing, took the x-ray. And then now you have this moment where it's borderline awkward, but because we don't know exactly how that went previously, whoever they saw that had, had passed on that information. But irregardless, that was the take home that, hey, I'm bone on bone. Then you take the image and now it's not bone on bone. So now how does that conversation play out or what does that what does that look like? Um, where's so, their mental headspace at through that conversation? Yeah, so that's really challenging because um, they usually – in this setting, when someone says, I've got bone on bone, more often than not, they're coming to the surgeon to get a knee replacement. And so they they emotionally have kind of gone through all of the struggle of like, you know, I've tried other things, it's not working. This is my last resort option. And you know what, I don't want to do it, but I'm ready. Like I wanted to, I just want to get it over with. And so, you know, they, they might, you know, come in with that concept. That's super common. And then I get the x-rays and it's not uncommon for me to get x-rays and see like very minimal degenerative changes or to see something that isn't that bad that maybe somebody called bone on bone but it was a poor projection on the x-ray you know you look back at the other films and it wasn't a joint line view so instead of you know instead of having the joint line line up if you if you don't get an x-ray in line with the joint line then it will look like the bones are touching but that's just because you didn't get your x-ray in line with the joint. And I think that's what happens a lot. I think they get a poor x-ray and it's actually a normal joint space. They get told it's bone on bone. There's nothing they can do. They've got to have a knee replacement. And um, and then they come and you get a good x-ray and you're like, oh, no, that's that's not the case. Like we, we actually have a lot to work with here. Um, and uh, so first off, I try to get x-rays and show them. I try to talk to them about what I feel are the, the, the best conservative options. And, and my, you know, my impression of the literature, which is, you know, I go through, okay, if you look at what science has to offer and what's most likely to help with arthritis, which you do have some arthritis, but it, it's, it's not horrible. I think that we can manage this. I say, you know, number one is going to be trying to work on weight loss and weight loss has consistently been shown to help people feel better. It's not a quick solution, but over the, long, over the long haul, it's very important. And I'll usually give an analogy of like, you know, you lose five pounds and you get momentary stresses going through your knees that might be, you know, 35, 40 pounds of stress. Be, and, and losing that five pounds can take off, you know, the 35 to 40 pounds of momentary stress you get going down the stairs or something like that. So weight loss, number one. Number two is going to be physical therapy. 
um, which I, I actually got to have a question about you for that one. Um, and, uh, but I explained, you know, it's it, therapy helps your knee function and, and you get a lot of wobble and arthritic knees, you get the nerves kind of shutting down. So the muscles don't want to fire and that fires everything up. So we got to get your knee in better shape. And then the third thing is going to be medications like injections, anti-inflammatories. And beyond that, like there's some braces and things like that that may be helpful for certain situations, but 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 not nothing that's super predictable. Those are kind of the big options. And yeah. I think the one that I often get 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 a little bit caught up on, and this is where I, I want to ask you is like, how do you how like what can physical therapy do if it's already wore out? Because that's what the patient's first thing they say is like. Well, if my joints wore out, like what's physical therapy going to do? How's that going to help? Yeah, I think where I'd love to start with that is the, the beginning of the conversation and then end back up on where is the application of rehabilitation in there. And I think it all comes back to the initial conversation, right? So to define where we are in our talk here, I think is the exact same thing like a patient's trying to take their mind through. So they saw a provider. Some provider told them it's bone on bone. In this great case that you got to see today, realize actually it, it's not all the way there. And then now we're at this predicament, right? So now we've got these four options. But the hardest part is that a lot of times that kiss of death has almost already occurred and they heard the bone on bone. And it's almost like, well, might as well just quit talking because anything else that's happening, that's where their mind goes. And the hardest part is, is it's so quick for people to accidentally jump instantly into, we're not a biological living being, we're a car. And right away they think, oh, it's wore out. Well, might as well just go ahead and protect it. Let's not use it. And then just hopefully it just doesn't wear out any worse. And that seems to be the mindset that we see all of the time. It's this logic step that I guess it's just human nature to say, I have this problem I was told, that I no longer have the space in my knee, the bone's hitting the bone, and that is such a graphic mindset to most people of, ah, oh, geez, so the bone's just rubbing, and that's clearly getting worse, because if I had a car, and my tire's rubbing against that fender wall, or whatever the special name is for where that <laughs> that tire goes, the <laughs> wheel well, or whatever, if it's rubbing, you just can't go many miles before that thing blows. So it's it's like our mind attaches to whatever we already know, and I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble because now when we start talking about the concepts and what we've learned through the research, like you spend so much time in reviewing as well, is, okay, what are we really seeing? What's really occurring here? And, and that's the hard part is if, if someone's already in that mindset, it is so hard to change that. And, and that's where I would love for us as an entire healthcare community to start moving away from that conversation, unless that's literally the only conversation. But that's obviously going to be a hard thing. I mean, we've we've got well over 300 documented cases of that phrase has been said to us before we've ever brought up anything. And a lot of times we'll test their knee flexion and extension. They'll have full passive hyperextension. They'll have great flexion. Well, like, where's this coming from? And it's a, a real challenge uh, for us. So I think it first starts there is, are, are we really even dealing with that case? Or are we having to deal with now? They've already attached this buy-in to this, you know, uh, aggressive language that that really sets them up for, for failure. Because I instantly would do the same thing. If, if my, I was like, oh no, my knee's bone on bone. Well, what does that mean? Oh, so it's wore out. Well, what fixes the bone on bone? And now here we go. Because now we're following the logic steps down an answer that, that may not actually be the answer. And that's where it gets really challenging is that once we get in that, I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car logic step. Well, the only way to fix the car is, is get that repair. And that's yeah. where it, it gets challenging. Um, but to answer your question about, all right, well, what is the role for rehabilitation or, or what can happen in these cases? I really think that we first have to start talking a little nerdy. And so my whole goal is to not get nerdy on here and not get too <laughs> sciencey, but I, I struggle to come up with a, a good way to explain it without at least talking a little bit about what you've already spoke about, which is the articular cartilage and such. And so one thing that I think you did a really great job of is explaining very simply that, look, we have this 
almost like a sole of a shoe or this shock absorber material built into our body, which is, is that articular cartilage. And so that's just, you have the bones, then you have this great layer that's there. Now that layer is 80% water. So we know that that area, the way we get that mechanism to do a great job is by pumping it. So when we move it, when we use it and we, you know, load it evenly. When we, we just really share that load well, do repetitive movements, we really get good fluid turnover in that cartilage because we're, we're pumping it, we're using it. And like you said, is if we have an area that maybe that's not the case, if we get stuck in this, this bind of, oh, it's hurting, well, now I better protect, I better slow down, and now I lose muscle mass because it hurts, I don't use it, I go to some disuse, this is a, a cascade that we see that goes out of control really fast that turns into a health problem all around because like, ooh, I got knee pain. And now when I hurt, up, oh, I better stop moving because it must be the moving that's causing it. And it's that logic step that just seems innate. That is just That's the one thing that we go to. That's the flaw that we see all of the time. And that's the... The double whammy. And then if we add the kiss of death on top of it, which is, hey, babe, you're, you're bone on bone here. And now they already were protecting, moving, not using. It's, a, it's just a quadruple whammy. Yeah, I, I liked what you were saying there. So motion uh, is so important, important for cartilage health. So, um, you know, and, and this, the, the base, you know, the, the science behind this has evolved a lot. Um, you know, in, in general, we have a concept that I think is fairly accurate about cartilage, which is, um, you know, let's say like you're a runner, the more you run, the more you're going to wear out your knees. So, or if people do a lot of athletics or if they have, they work really hard labor, we, we have a general concept that like, I wore out my knee doing this, or I wore out my knee doing that. And that seems very logical, but some of that has been challenged. Um, you look at some of these like high endurance runners and they will get, you know, they'll have like super healthy cartilage or, you know, there's another side of it that like they did a basic science project at my uh, uh, residency, uh, University of Iowa, and they caused cartilage injury in rabbits. And then half of them, they put X fixes on, which just hold their joints so they can't move at all. And then half of them, they put on a treadmill and make, made them run. And then they looked at the cartilage injuries that were caused, you know, I think six, eight weeks down the road. And what they found was the ones they, th you know, you would think, oh, well, the ones that are protected, that's going to help uh, give it a, a time to heal. And the ones on the treadmill, that's, that's just going to make it worse. It was the opposite. Like the ones that were immobilized had no healing. And then the ones that were on the treadmill actually did really like their cartilage had healed. And there's some similar studies in humans that have been done in ankles with uh, uh, distractors that allow some motion, but they don't allow any contact. The, the big picture is that cartilage actually has some healing potential and the way that it heals is based upon motion and pressure that's put through it. So like complete immobilization or taking activity out of it, taking motion out of it, that's going to cause the opposite effect. Like if you want, in order to get things to heal, you, you actually have to use it and move it. And, you know, we don't weigh rab what rabbits weigh. So I think that's a factor, but but trying sure. to do, uh, I always emphasize like smart exercise where you're getting motion um, can can help your knee heal, especially if you can try to eliminate some of the weight factors. Yeah, I completely agree. The thing that we see all the time is that they get stuck in that cascade of how it hurts. Maybe they did see someone and they said, oh, yeah, you probably just need to rest it. Now they rest it. Now it hurts more. They get more disuse, less activity. They get deconditioned, and now all of a sudden, oh, it hurts every time I go up the stairs, or it hurts every time that I go to move it, and oh, pain must equal bad, so I better stop. That's the cascade that we accidentally get into, and whatever we can do to drive that away, we've got to. I think everything you said was just dead on with what we see from the rehab side of things, because we'll have someone come in, this happens all the time, that will have their images right away, we'll pull them up on Premiere, put them up on the TV to be able to show them. And they'll say, yeah, you know, I had these films taken. Here's my knee. All right, well, it does look, you can see quite a bit of degeneration, et cetera. You go to do the exam, you notice that their thigh on one side is typically missing, missing size, the one that's been hurting for quite a while. Now that could be for multiple reasons, but very commonly it hurts a lot. They're not using it. So they say, ah, oh, I'm just going to favor it. Now they're favoring the knee. 
It hurts more. So we have to have that conversation. Here's where we're at. It hurts like heck. Well, we've got to get this thing moving more because you're accidentally creating too much compression on it by favoring it, guarding it, and you're not pumping the nutrition into that knee at all. And the hardest part is, is if they already have that degeneration, what I love that you eloquently said earlier was that when you go into their knee, they actually will have quite a bit of okay cartilage. So meaning the, the cascade they accidentally get stuck in is, well, we know that that's made up of a lot of fluid content. When we pump it, it gets its nutrition. That's its protective response is what makes the knee feel great. Well, now all of a sudden they're stopping doing that. But if they already have a little bit of a worn down knee, well, we know that they've already lost some of that potential to store water as well. So they've lost that ability, but now they're not moving it any at all and they're guarding it, which means the cartilage that they do have left, they're not even doing its best job to maximize it. So it's, it's infinitely worse. And when they're stuck in that, that is the hardest moment where we have to work really, really hard to be able to get that teamwork where they trust us to say, look, we've got to start forging forward with this. Yes, we've got a lot of great hands-on techniques. We've got, you know, we can use dry kneeling. We have laser, we have hands-on. We have all these things that can calm your pain down just a little bit, but all of that is a means to get you moving, get that pumping mechanism going and get you strong again, because that's the win. Um, the last piece on that, that before I just stop ranting, I, I just get heated, I guess. But when you what you said that was so good was if I if they're a dancer, they'll they'll instantly jump back to, well, that must have been what wore my knees out. And the hardest part there is, man, that fitness and activity was probably the most protective thing, you know, that you were doing. It's what's really happened in this last year or two, because dancing, you're talking about eight, nine years ago. If a year ago you were fine and then now you're not. All right, let's talk about this last year. Let's let's chart the activity level. And all the time, there's a, there's a cascade of, of other events that have occurred that have really tripped that off. And it's that disparity is where we've got to just be able to jump in and do a great job. But I find that we really only get about one good shot at it because otherwise they're back to confirming that bias. And, and I know what it's right. like. It's just, it's disheartening. But if we right. jump in there appropriately, oh, the good stuff can come, baby. And if, if you get someone that's completely set on the, like, that's not going to work. I, I need a knee replacement. You know, they can come to me and I can say, hey, no, it's not. And I can explain it. But if they don't hear it and they don't hear it from you and they don't, or whoever, if they just really get fixed on this is what I need, they will end up finding somebody that will do a knee replacement on them. But so often, and I see people every single week that have gotten knee replacements, and then they're like, I didn't know I couldn't run on this. Like I, I was actually running b before. Like you, you now I can't run, or you know, and they're they're unhappy with the results. They come as a second opinion, saying like, why? Why can't I kneel on a knee replacement? Why can I only bend it 120 degrees? You know, I, I yeah. could bend it 135 before. I mean, they don't say those numbers, but they just point it out. And it's because they, they got fixed on a knee replacement as the solution when that, that wasn't the solution that they needed. And, and related to like that, uh, um, the concept of like uh, activity and motion and exercise being important and helping knee arthritis. The, the other thing that I see really commonly, especially in our culture, is people are going 100 miles an hour. Like they work, they're working two jobs, they, they're on their feet all day, and they're like, I'm already super active. Like, or hey, I, I work a ranch or I work, you know, I do these, these activities that like I'm in shape. Like I, I work hard. And, yeah. and I have to say, well, it's not that you don't work hard, but you're, you're tearing it down all day. Like we've got to do some exercises that are going to build it back up. So you talk about like the pumping, the cartilage, you know, stimulating it to try to get it to uh, heal and repair itself. Like, I think there are ways that are very effective to do that and other ways that, you know, are more wear and tear. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. Like a lot of people feel like they're active, but you check their, their muscle strength and function, their coordination. And it's horrible. <laughs> Really, yeah, it's, exactly. it's just that they're on their feet all day. It's not that they're, you know, they're doing a lot of things. They're actually compensating and the muscles are shutting down and getting worse, which makes the problem worse. So having yeah. the right type of exercise, I think, is, is is critical. Exactly. And I think that's where the variability is lost. So what happens so often is exactly what you said. They'll 
have a job where they're always on their feet and then maybe they do recreational projects around their house and it's the exact same thing that but if you really watched the movements they're doing they're very much a front to back motion and they're upright most all the time and if we watch our kids look at how they vary in movement right if we watch athletics look how we're varying in movement and so often it's as we get more adult and more locked into now I need to be a provider for my family we get stuck in these motions that it, we're just not doing anything to really bring the robustness and the health to us as an entire person. And that's the hard part for a lot of them to grasp. We had a, a whole slew of questions just come in, and one of them's right on the, these lines. And Alan had asked, okay, so someone has, they know for a fact that they have decreased cartilage, and they are doing everything they can to stay active. They still have some pain. How do they differentiate between a new pain and the, all right, I have a little bit of pain because I'm just trying to get back active. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. And, uh, and a lot of times I'll tell people like, first off, you probably, you've been living in your body for a very long time and you know your body better than I know your body. So I'm listening to you and I want you to really explain what's going on. And then I think seeing patterns uh, are very helpful because you know, anybody when they start working out, like our, you know, these Vanderbilt athletes that come in, they've got healthy joints, like the first two weeks, they feel worse and worse and worse and worse because they're out of shape and they are just busting them hard to get into shape. And, um, so we often, I can't tell you how often I see people like, oh, well, I started an exercise program and it's just killing me. And it's like, well, when did you start two weeks ago? It's like, okay, well, your body's got to have some time to adapt. Like, there, So when I look at the adaptive process, I, I say like two weeks, you're going to be feeling worse and worse and worse if you're starting something new. Four weeks, you're going to be wondering if this is making a difference. And then by six weeks, you're going to have a good idea. And you should see that things are improving. You should feel convinced that, hey, I've, I've made progress. I'm making improvements. If it's six weeks into a new program, you are, are thinking like it's getting worse, not better, then you need to make a new, you know, you need to evaluate what's going on. And maybe, maybe it is actually to that point that, Hey, we've got to intervene and do something different because this isn't, this isn't working. Yeah. I think the most important take home is that concept that you just brought up of it's gotta be just like learning to read. You started off with little words, then they got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. You graduated one grade at a time. But guess what? You were really horrible at reading for a really long time. and But now all of a sudden, look, you can read really well. You had a whole lump of patience on that beginning side. And that's I'm watching my five-year-old go through that right now. So it just hits home really well that, yeah, she'll pick up another word, get another word, but her persistence is there. It's almost like our tolerance to commit to anything the older we get just really shrinks is what it feels like to me because when someone's in two to three weeks and they're just, oh man, just burn it down. Like it's over. It's like, man, that is so short of a timeline. But exactly. I think the best we can do as providers is prep them for what the journey's looking like because we have really good evidence of what that's going to look like, right? The stats are pretty clear. That first three weeks is yeah. exactly like you said. They're going to hurt more if they've been guarding it. They've lost muscle mass. They're always up on their feet. It's just going to be crummy for the first several weeks. But as we start to turn that corner, get closer to that six-week mark, it's like, oh, man, I didn't notice my knee for like half the day today. That was cool. And then now they start getting momentum, get stronger. But that's where the expertise comes in from the rehab side is where you can't accidentally just fall into, okay, cool. These are the best knee exercises. Let me go hammer those every day. I'll do three sets of 10. And, and I'm going to do great. My knee's going to be happy because that is the exact opposite of how the body works. The more we do something, the more efficient we get at it. The more efficient we get at it, the less adaptive change we're going to get. So it has to be that well-prescribed, all right, where are we? More like braces. We're going to slowly adjust it one at a time, keep progressively loading it to make sure you're getting stronger and stronger, always adapting. And that's how you get to the point where you can take control. And now you get a buffer zone back. Where now you can really go out and be crazy a few days a week and all of a sudden it's not bad anymore because you've built up that resiliency. And, and I think it's just that the more we can do on the front end 
to almost come off like we're just seeing the future, the better it is for them. And I think that's something that I messed up horribly 10, 11 years ago. I was the worst at predicting that for them. So two weeks in, they're like, man, I'm, I'm supposed to be a third of the way through this thing and my knees suck. So I'm out. And it's like, oh, geez, we, we didn't even get started. And so that's where I think the, the expertise lies. And I think that's the important concept there. The other thing that I like to bring up is red flags. So hmm. telling patients like, okay, what to expect and what are things that we need to change our plan? Like it's not, you know, things aren't quite going well. And so, you know, it, we have a lot of catchphrases in medicine that we use as red flags, that, but they're not good red flags. For example, we say, oh, does your knee feel unstable? If you have like a ligament injury, like an ACL, PCL, collateral ligament, you know, you, you need to address that. And that's going to make your knee unstable. And so we ask, you know, if I ask somebody with arthritis that has, I've just examined their knees and I say, hey, does your knee feel unstable? I'm going to say 99% of the time, they're going to say, yeah, I, I feel unstable. So instability is not really a good red flag unless you had a major traumatic event. And by major yeah. traumatic, I mean, there was something, a specific time when you said, I fell, I slipped, or, you know, something twisted, I felt a pop, and then my knee swelled up. And the combination of feeling a pop and your knee swelling up, that that is a uh, definitely something that should be paid attention to and, and ruled out before you're doing an exercise program. Um, and then the other thing is like catching, popping, um, uh, locking, like catching, popping, locking, those are not a big deal. Um, and, and most of us feel those types of sensations when it's a problem is if your knee, like I would say a locking mechanism, when you're, when your knee gets physically stuck in one position, like you cannot move it, that's a locked knee and that's a problem. And usually people will describe a lot of pain. They can't move it. Most of the time is they can't straighten it. It's usually not that they can't bend it, <laughs> but if they can, if you cannot straighten your leg and it's stuck. And then all of a sudden it pops and then you can straighten it. That would suggest another red flag. Like, okay, that's a locking mechanism. But as far as like pops go, catches, most of those are not a big deal. And if it's, if it's a painful pop, it's a little more concerning. But most of the pops, if we really pay attention to them, the crunching in our knees, those happen in almost everybody. And they're, they're really not concerning things. And if you pay attention, you'll be like, oh, yeah, it's not the pop that's causing the pain. I just have the pain and it pops. It's more annoying and, and we're more aware of it. So not to worry about pops. Worry about um, uh, if it's actually locking. And then, the, and then uh, instability, but only if there was like a pop and swelling. Um, I think those are the, the, the really big things. And then the last thing is swelling on the knee because... Almost everybody that comes into the clinic feels like their knee's swollen if they're coming in for a knee problem. Not, not everybody, but I would say at least three quarters of the people. And most of the time when they describe swelling, they kind of point to the area below the knee. Like if you look at your knee and you've got your kneecap right in the center, the, the area is just below where the kneecap is side to side, right up on the high shin area. They often will get a little bit puffy, but it has nothing to do with what's going on inside the joint. When you have an inside the joint problem, you get a lot of swelling, but it's above the kneecap. And you can actually usually, you know, push that around and, and feel it, but, but that will decrease your motion. You won't be able to bend your knee all the way. If you start getting, that's called an effusion when you get fluid inside the joint. If you get an effusion, that's another thing that's like, okay, we, we should evaluate that. We shouldn't just ignore it. Uh, but the swelling below the knee, like below the kneecap, that usually is not problematic and it's not concerning. So if you're having swelling above the knee, it should be checked out, but b below the knee is not too worrisome. Yeah. So I think those what red I, flags are helpful for people to be aware of. Man, so good. Um, and the more that individuals can understand that, I think the better, you know, when it's, if it's legitimately completely locked up or you've got a massive, if you, you know, those are the times where, all right, seek a good evaluation from clinician. All right, let's see where you're at. Let's see how you got there and let's see how we get out of it. One of the, um, great researchers that we have always been uh, just really looked up to and uh, someone I consider a little bit of a mentor. It's a guy named Peter O'Sullivan, and he has a great analogy for explaining that mechanism of the popping and snapping in the knee. And the way that he explained that, I've used probably, I don't know, 5,000 times with patients because it hits home so well, is that same thing. When you have that popping, snapping, and it hurts, it's typically someone that's already been hurting a little bit, but we naturally go protective. 
We want to protect that because it hurts and we don't know exactly what's going on. And I want to be very clear that we're not saying, oh, I hurt. Awesome. Sprint through it and let's do everything we can to just push through the pain and ignore it because that's not the take home at all. But it does mean that there are options. There are ways that you can progress through that and pass that. But we do need to be realistic about what those goals look like. But the way that he explained it that always resonated really well with me is he would always have individuals take their wrist and he would say, okay, I'm going to have you take your wrist. I just want you to draw a big wrist circle. And when you do that, I want you to really think about what you feel in the wrist and just, just take notice of that. Now I want you to make a really tight fist, draw the exact same size circle and tell me if it feels any different. And typically they'll notice instantly more guarding, more popping, some snapping, a little bit more discomfort because you naturally get that compression. That compression, that irritation is the exact same thing that we will do with a knee that we're nervous to use now because it hurts, but we're accidentally overly compressing it and making it more uncomfortable with every step. And the job of a great rehab provider is to be able to start getting that tension compression gone and dosing the exercise just right to where you get stronger. The muscle can take over the job again get that healthy fluid back inside the knee. And all of a sudden now it's like, oh, that just, like if you had to hold your hand and work like this all day long, it would be miserable. It but hurt. We we do it all the time with our other body parts and don't realize that's what we're doing. And so if we could let that go, you just say, oh, thank goodness, I can finally let that go. That's what we need to make happen from the knee side, from the rehabilitation perspective. No, that's a, that's a fantastic analogy. So, so uh, a little bit along the lines, we've talked kind of about degenerative arthritis um, and, and rehab and the role that it plays. Um, going to a different note, which is on the, I guess, the earlier end of the spectrum, like when you see a patient with a meniscus tear, you know, what, what goes through your head? Is it, you know, is it, okay, no, I got to send you back to the surgeon? Is it, you know, how, how do you, uh, what do you see as terms of re recovery potential? Because you know what I what I see in clinic is once once a patient hears a tear, then mm -hmm. then they feel immediately like I I can't you know this is not going to get better like how is it going to heal and you say well it's not going to heal in terms of grow back together it's going to keep bothering me so w when you hear meniscus tear what what happens in in your typical typical interactions. Yeah, the most important thing for us is we want to see progressively like as the weeks go on less guarding less swelling less pain. And what we almost always see with, with a meniscus case is they're going to have, when we bend their knee and flex their knee, they'll, ha they'll have the swelling, but they'll also have that, that really uncomfortable joint line pain. So right at the joint line feels really uncomfortable. Uh, we'll do our testing. It all adds up. And typically there's the, the biggest categories to determine, was there a thing that happened or was there not a thing that happened? And, and that is the biggest differentiator for us right away. Is this a traumatic thing that occurred? Like we literally had this right at the beginning of COVID, uh, a, a, a very healthy female standing on her patio, big dog, jumps, hits her knee, feels a pop, doesn't know what's going on, knee swells up right away, but also lives with um, individuals that are at extremely high risk of, of contracting COVID, doesn't want to go anywhere, knees a balloon, you know, really guarding it. And so we jumped on telehealth. And the thing that was really important to me right away was, look, we're going to evaluate, see how you're doing. We're going to do everything we can to teach you all the right techniques and do the right treatments to get the fluid off this knee the best possible. Because with that, we know we're, we're going to get a host of other problems. And the big one is we're going to notice that we're going to start to shut down our thigh. Our thigh is going to want to not work as well because of that much swelling. So we need to do whatever we can to try to get that down right away. And her case, because it was so black and white with a mechanism that's on my bias spectrum of I'm kicking that one out uh, pretty quickly, almost in every case. Um, it was even uncomfortable until you know that first moment, like, well, here's where we're at. But if we turn a corner within three or four weeks of doing the right rehab, then all right, well, then that, that's going to change things dramatically. But where are you at when I talk to the patient about their values and their timeline? How much time do they have and can they give to it? And in their case, they were actually working from home and felt very confidently that, this next six, eight weeks of their life, they're like, man, this does suck, but here's where I'm at. There's not a panacea in the next five days coming. Let's give it a shot. So instantly, since she had that idea of, hey, let's give it a shot, we got right away started and noticed 
dramatic changes in the, in the fluid loss. We got to where the popping and catching stopped at the four week mark completely. Got back to walking without a limp. Notice other people in the neighborhood were noticing, hey, you're no longer limping. What the heck's going on? You know, they're like, hey, I'm just doing my therapy, doing what I'm supposed to, you know, doing the exercises, doing the strengthening. And that is something that's very uh, encouraging to be able to see from someone to be able to do. They're doing their self manual work, you know, doing everything that we could show them to be able to do the techniques to try to get some of that fluid off the knee. And uh, man, they just really excelled with it. So, I think the most important thing to us right away is find out where the patient's headspace is at because if they're if they're pushing that, oh, I need a scan right away, that's always the hardest part because what's so important to us as evidence-based providers is is finding out, all right, where's our values, where's the patient's values, and then what's the research tells timeline-wise and the best that we can explain that to them, hopefully we can come together and if we can work as a good team, Hopefully we can hold off that scan because the scan a lot of times is that kiss of death that's really difficult because now they they get fixated on, I'm stuck on the tear, I'm stuck on the tear, so now what? And so that's what we end up seeing, but I think the benefit um, that sometimes can get misconstrued in the rehab world is that individuals who self-select us first or they get a hold of a great provider and maybe they did a phone call and they said, hey, you know, go do some strengthening on this, get some manual manual rehab done work, um, when they get that pushed first, the individuals that come there are already open to that idea of let's try something first before I'm aggressively pushing a scan or a procedure. So I also, go that goes through my head a lot too, is that are, are we getting a biased section of the world because they already are wanting to try to stay conservative and not do that as well. So that's yeah. some of the chainsaws that I juggle in my head all the time. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting with meniscus tears because the, you know, it, this is one of those problems that uh if you turn back the clock like 15 20 years, the most common orthopedic procedure um and it, it, you saw a tear, you operated like it was just like, mm. you know, if you're you're a carpenter, you see nails up, you got a hammer in your hand, you hit it. You know, I would say that was the same type of philosophy that would that happened with orthopedics and um what we've seen, and this is something that I learned, you know, in my training, we talked a little bit about it with shoulder, but we treat patients, not imaging studies. And imaging studies um, don't always tell the whole picture, and they don't tell you how someone can rehab. They don't tell you how someone can heal necessarily. And um, it's it's really important to uh, take the big picture. I, li I like what you said about traumatic event versus, uh, versus a traumatic event, because the a traumatic events, I think, frequently do really well with therapy and frequently do poorly if they push for surgery. And the traumatic ones do more often, uh, I would say, benefit from surgery, but a lot of them get better without having to do surgery. And so so just because you had a traumatic event doesn't mean you're not going to get better with surgery. Um, and then and then there's interesting, like the, the patterns you see of the different types of meniscus tears, they, they make a big difference. And when I'm deciding if I want to do surgery on someone or not, I really want the most up-to-date scan as possible. Mm. So uh, things are evolving. Things change. Um, I would rather do, you know, six weeks of therapy and try to rehab it if everything makes clinical sense and their history makes sense and their exam makes sense and then get an MRI right before I operate, then do an MRI and say, yeah, I'm not really sure. I think it go this way. It might go that way. You know, and then we're doing you know, six weeks, 12 weeks of therapy. And let's say like, you know, a couple months down the road, they're like, yeah, I want surgery, but then we don't really have the most up-to-date picture. So I, I like yeah. to wait on images just to have the most up-to-date. So I know what I'm dealing with when I'm making a decision. And, and, uh, and most of these patients I think do benefit from uh, 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 a round of physical therapy first. Um, and then there's there's a uh, have you ever read that article uh, in the New York Times? Why are we still doing useless surgery? Oh yeah, yeah. So so it's a great article that's act accessible to everyone. But it it basically said you know it's a it's a layman's view and it summarizes a handful of randomized controlled trials and in in these trials of various different types, early arthritis, no arthritis, they're basically looking at meniscus tears and when people get sham surgery, so people in these studies, for example, this one study was degenerative meniscal tears. So they have pain that comes on, 
They didn't recall an event. You know, they tried three months of conservative treatment, which was a combination of injections or therapy. Then they got an MRI that shows a degenerative tear. When I say degenerative, that usually means horizontal. Um, and then they half the group gets surgery. Well, they all get surgery, but half of them, they just look at it. And half of them, they actually trim out the damaged portion or, you know, do a, a treatment for it. And then when the, the surgeons are blind, when the patients are blinded, the follow-up clinicians are blinded, meaning they don't know which treatment group they're in. They all do about the same. <laughs> so yeah. it really changed like, oh, um, we, we're, we're not necessarily helping them in the ways we think that we're helping them. Um, and, and so there's been multiple randomized controlled trials that have, that have shown like therapy is probably the way to go. Injections are definitely something you should consider, um, at, you know, looking at other modalities and being really patient with it. Um, you know, when it, when it gets to the point that people aren't doing well or they have a locking knee, um, then I think surgery plays a, a more significant role. Or you look at a major tra traumatic event where somebody's running, pivoting, they feel a pop. That that is a different scenario because a lot of times those meniscus tears we can we can repair and they're a different pattern. Those those are usually vertical tears that go up and down on the meniscus. They're often more not always but often more peripheral in an area of the meniscus that has be better blood supply, so they have more healing potential. Um, but uh, you know I think it's the the role for you know just because you have a tear really doesn't mean a lot when you're initially starting to manage the uh, meniscus. So getting the MRI really doesn't help a lot early on. I think it, it can help down the road when you're really trying to sort out what the best option is. But early on, a, a lot of times, you know, doing a, a good clinical exam, a history, that's probably the most important thing in managing these. I think so too. And the best part about what you just said that I think will probably get overlooked is the patient's piece. Because there has been, I guess it's just easier in, in so many studies that we read for them to just say, all right, well, we're going to do six weeks of rehab. And then now we're going to just do follow-ups after that and just see how they did. The hardest part is in real life, six weeks is such a definitive time period. And that is very unfair to so many people, in my opinion, especially when I look at it from the physician level and evaluating every aspect of their health. I mean, when they come see us, the benefit of having that physician level training and, and doing a lot of rehab and hands-on work is that we do a really thorough evaluation of all their body systems. And the biggest thing is, is we can build a stat sheet right away on a lot of people as to reasons why six weeks is probably not going to be a very realistic timeline for them to be where they want to be. And right. that's the hardest thing is that it seems like so frequently it's when we hear of individuals like, oh man, it's been six weeks, it's almost like individuals already know a six week timeline, like I better be better in six weeks or this thing's just, you know, it must need an operation. And I think that's the message that is really important to clear up is that, you know, work with somebody that can really evaluate all those things and don't accidentally set a date. The calendar is the number one killer with these conditions that get yeah. us through a procedure because the stats are, are just pretty obvious. If you went into that surgery with a limp, I mean, there's stats that you're going to come out of that surgery with a limp. And then if we don't do the right amount of strengthening, we don't fix a lot of those issues on the front end, they're, they're going to be there. And it, that's not the panacea. They just, it's that thought virus just gets in there that, oh man, if it doesn't get fixed, I'm never going to be okay. And, and that's the message that I think we have to work so hard as clinicians every day, swim up that hill, whatever we have to do to clear up that message. And I really appreciate you just banging that drum so well and being such a great advocate uh, for patients. I think that's incredible. Yeah, I love what you said about timelines too, because timelines set you up for failure, as you mentioned. And in terms of like most of the surgeries I do, I don't use timelines and I tell the patients, I, I try to tell them that it's not like you're gonna be done. I say, look, you're recovering from, let's say a, uh, a meniscus repair or, or an ACL uh, tear. Um, the average is going to be like we say you're you're healed in let's say six months, but one person might still be having issues at nine months or twelve months, and another person might feel amazing and really be ready to do a lot at three months. Um, so so you know most of the good um, protocols are not based upon timelines at all. They're based upon functional evaluations of how Absolutely. people are doing. And Preach, baby. You know, 
that's what I do is like I, when they come back to clinic and they say, hey, doc, it's six months. Like I, you, you fix my ACL. Like, am I ready to go? And I instead of saying like, oh, you, you reached the six months, your x-rays look great. Your knee exam looks great. And I say, OK, do a single leg squat, do a single leg pistol grip, do um, a single leg hop test. Show me how you're moving. And what I'm looking for is symmetry. Like, are they back to normal? And when you find functional deficits, that's what you need to focus on because and that's what needs to determine when people are ready to go back. And, uh, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, I, last year I had uh, one of our Vanderbilt basketball players that, you know, we, we were holding much longer than, you know, your typical like six month expectation is for being able to get back to support to sports with higher level athletes. And we held him longer because his muscles just weren't quite there. And then when he did go back, like he was ready and his risks were much lower of having a problem with that again. So ladder based, you know, functional uh, uh, progress is so much more important than any timeline you can put on it. Man, there's nothing else I can say to wrap up this show better than what you just did. So, Jaron, my man, I thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, we've got to get you back on for another topic. I've only got about 94 more that I want to go through with you. So I just appreciate you so much. The community appreciates that out of you. So many comments came in tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Thank you for having me.